Father in heaven, you're an awesome God. You're a great God. You're a good God. You're an eternal God who reigns on your throne in heaven at this very moment. And the angels are surrounding the throne. And to you and to the Lord Jesus Christ, they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for 2022. Lord, we are determined. We are focused. We are pressing in. We're studying your word, exposition style, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, loving you, obeying you, trusting you, and moving forward in our walk with you. So Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, come and revive our hearts. Pour out a fresh and anew in our hearts and our lives, on our families, on our children, on, on those who aren't feeling well today, Lord. Pour out your spirit and revive us in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Great to see you guys this morning. So here we are, <clears throat> 2022. And I, pray, I prayed about this. And the Lord was leading me and guiding me. I started planning this back in September. And I knew that January 1st, we were going to start off with a bang. We are going to study the book of Revelation. A book that many people steer away from because of all the controversy. But not at Calvary Chapel. We're tackling it. We're going head on. we got a couple over here, Stephanie, that still need the booklets too. Again, it's the Revelation prophecy chart that we're giving you that you can keep with you and look over. And also... Uh, the Triumph of the Lamb bookmark. We want everyone to have one so you can follow along. And, and as, we, as I teach the passage on Sunday, you can go home on Sunday afternoon and reflect, study. I had a brother text me yesterday. He said, hey, man, what's the deal with all the sevens in the book of Revelation? I did a little research real quick, and, and I said, I'm not sure, but there, guess how many sevens are in the book of Revelation? 61. 61 times the book of Revelation mentions uh, the number seven. But the title of my message this morning, the title of my teaching for today is Embracing Revelation. Embracing Revelation. Many Christians avoid this book. They say it's too hard to understand all the symbolism, all the mysteries. Leaders do not want to teach on it because of all the different positions and they don't want to ruffle the feathers and create controversy. So what happens is it sits in the back of every believer's Bible and it collects dust. And that cannot be said of one of the greatest New Testament books, the book of Revelation. Tim LaHaye said, the book of Revelation is a source of happiness to anyone who will read it. Hear it in the depths of his heart, obey its instructions. If, every, if ever there was a generation that needed to study this book, it's our generation. We are probably living in the times when these things will begin to come to pass. So again, this morning, today, this is just an introduction. We're going to dive into these first eight verses, but this is just a big picture overview introduction to the book of Revelation. Why is it important? Why is it important as a Christian to embrace the book of Revelation? Number one reason, it prepares you for the future. It is the unfolding end of time plan that God will use to bring our age to an end. It's the completion of the cross, really. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. He rose from the grave. Well, salvation is not complete, okay? Our salvation is secure, and we're going to heaven when we pass. But one day, the final stage of salvation, which is what we call glorification, hasn't taken place yet. But one day, family, you're going to get a brand new body. You're going to get a brand new body. No sickness, no disease, and it's going to last forever. If that ain't worth shouting, I don't know what is. He's given us eternal life. He's given us eternal life. The second reason we need to embrace the book of Revelation is... It is inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. The Greek is theonostos. It means it's literally breathed out from the mouth of God. You can trust the book of Revelation because it is his inspired word. 
Thirdly, it causes us to love and obey Jesus more. When you get into the book of Revelation and you understand it, oh, your heart is just going to melt how great and how awesome your Lord and Savior is. You know, he's not this meek and mild little Jesus. He's the sovereign Lord and creator of the universe who's ruling and reigning over everything. Family, there's nothing to fear in studying this book if you are a Christian. It is the story. It is the story of your Savior's triumph. So let's look at the prophecy chart real quick. Open up your little prophecy booklet. If you're joining with us online, join with us next Sunday and you'll get your prophecy booklet. But anyway, this little prophecy chart lays out the book of Revelation. And this morning, we'll be in chapter 1, where we're looking at the introduction. But you have the church age. You have the rapture of the church. You have the great tribulation period. Then um, after that, you have uh, Jesus Christ returning on a white horse, his thousand-year millennial reign, the great right throne of judgment, and then the new heavens and the new earth. Now, how many of you guys ever heard of uh, the different views? There's the... Uh, there's, Everybody looks at their eschatology in light of where they place the rapture, okay? Some people place the rapture at Calvary Chapel. We, we believe in the pre-tribulation view of the rapture, meaning the rapture will take place before the great tribulation, okay? Some people believe in what they call the pre-wrath view of the rapture, and that's one-fourth of the way into the book of Revelation. Then some people believe in the mid-trib they believe that Jesus will return halfway through the tribulation. And then finally we have our, our post-trib brothers and sisters. They believe that um, Jesus will come at the end of the great tribulation. I like what Paul Benware said in his book, Understanding the Times, which is a phenomenal book in studying eschatology. In the very beginning of his book, he says this, regardless of your position, we believe he's coming again. Okay? So we believe at Calvary Chapel and we teach pre-trib. And I'm fully convinced that that's where the, the rapture of the church takes place. But if you're a mid-trib or a post-trib or a pre-wrath, God bless you. God bless you. We love you. And let, let's talk about theology. Let's talk about eschatology. But here's the thing about uh, pre-trib, pre-wrath, uh, mid-trib, and post-trib. We all believe together that it's all future. That's the important thing. Just some of us put it in different orders. And that's okay. That's okay. Revelation is a unique book. There's lots of symbols. There's seals, bowls, trumpets, stars, mountains, horns. The number seven is used 61 times. Seven churches, seven, seven candlesticks, uh, seven spirits, seven horns, seven eyes, seven seals, seven angels, Seven trumpets, seven mountains, seven kings, seven bowls. Do I need to keep on going? We're, we're going to come across all of them. There's lots of sevens. Check this out. How about the Old Testament? How does the Old Testament connect to the book of Revelation? You ever thought about that? There are 404 verses in the book of Revelation that we're fixing to get into. And there are 278. Count them. 278 quotes from the Old Testament. Your knowledge of the Old Testament is very, very important as we study this book. It is a complicated book. So please pray for your pastor as I study during the week because I'm trying to get my head wrapped around all these symbols and all this stuff and refresh my memory as I prepare to teach it. Now, let's talk about this. This is very important as we, as we work our way through the book of Revelation. We want to be skilled we want to be sharp. We want to do this thing right. So let's talk about our rules of engagement. You know what rules of engagement are? Rules of engagement are how do we, how do we interpret the scripture. When we come across a difficult word, a difficult verse, how are we going to figure out what it means? And that is our two rules of interpretation. One is context, and the second is commentary. Context when you look at a verse, you look at a, a difficult, the seven spirits of God before the throne, which we'll see this morning. How do you interpret that? Well, let's look at the verses before it. Let's look at the verses after it. And let's try to figure out what he's talking about there. And then after we look at um, context, we look at commentary. What's the best commentary on the Bible? 
the Bible. So we'll look at where else is this mentioned at in the Bible, and we'll, we'll narrow it down to what we believe it is, what he's talking about in the text. That's how you interpret these difficult passages. So y'all ready to dive in? Okay, and just in case you're wondering about the picture, the picture, this picture for our backdrop for our study comes from Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. I'll let you read that on your own, but that is the angel, and that is John on the island of Patmos, and that's based on Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. But let me give you a little bit of historical context, historical context behind the book of Revelation in its writing in the first century. Around 90 AD, a second wave of persecution was upon the church. Under the previous emperor, Nero, Paul had been beheaded. Peter had been crucified upside down at Rome. And all the disciples except one had faced a martyr's death. Church history tells us that at the end of the first century, only John was alive and he was ministering at Ephesus. The church had experienced tremendous growth, but at the same time endured intense persecution under the Roman Empire. You see, in the first century, allegiance to Jesus Christ could cost you your life. Our favorite salvation verse is what? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We tell people that when we're sharing the gospel. Well, in the first century, that was a death sentence. That was a death sentence because in the first century, there's one Lord in the land and his name is Caesar. So to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord means you could, it could cost you your life. Emperor Domitian decided to follow in Nero's footsteps, persecuting anyone who would not swear allegiance to Caesar. And for this reason, John the Apostle, the author that wrote this book, was arrested and sentenced to be boiled alive in oil. But God intervened. God miraculously, excuse me, John miraculously survived the ordeal. And since they could not kill him, Domitian, I think I pronounced it right that time, banished John to the island of Patmos. Patmos is an island in the Aegean Sea. It's 10 miles long, 6 miles wide, 15 miles off the coast of Turkey. It's barren, rocky, and desolate. In the first century, it was where Roman prisoners were sent to do hard labor. It was the first century Alcatraz. It was here on this island that John, under extreme, intense persecution, received this vision of revelation from the angel, as you see in the picture. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, now as we dive into it, Lord, open our hearts and let us see the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, family. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. The most important thing you need to know about this book is in the first five words. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypse, apocalyptus. And what it... In, in our day, the word that we get from that is what? Apocalypse. And when people think apocalypse, they think doomsday. They think the end of time. But you need to understand, in the Greek language, in the Greek culture, the word revelation, apocalypse, it, all it simply means is the unveiling, the revealing. Okay? It's just the unveiling or the revealing. So the book of Revelation is the unveiling, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The center of the book of Revelation is not the end of the world, even though that's going to take place. It's not the center. The center of the book of Revelation is the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelations chapter 1, 2, and 3, Jesus is standing amongst the lampstands, and he's giving instructions to his seven churches. In Revelations chapter 4 and chapter 5, he's on his throne in heaven receiving worship. Revelations chapter 6 through 18, he's pouring out his wrath on a uh, Christ-forsaken world that's rebelling against him. In Revelation chapter 19, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords coming back on a white horse. Revelation chapter 20, he's reigning in his literal 1,000-year millennial kingdom here on earth. And in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, he is 
the glory of the new Jerusalem, the third heaven, the holy city. So yeah, we're going to talk about the resurrection. We're going to talk about how God's going to bring everything to an end. But here's the deal, family. The first principle that you need to understand in embracing revelation is to, to embrace revelation means you embrace the main person of revelation. Not the eschatology, even though it's important that we understand it, it's that you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life, suffered and died on the cross, and rose from the grave. He is the reigning conquering, eternal, sovereign creator and Lord of the universe. And that's what this book is about. It's about the revelation of the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also notice there at the end of verse 1, um, it says, God gave him to show his bondservant the things that which was what? What does that say right there? Soon take place. Wait a minute, Pastor David. It's been 2,000 years. It's been 2,000 years, and when this was written around 95 AD, he said the things must soon take place. First off, you need to understand God's timetable. God dwells outside the realm of time and space. He dwells in the realm of eternity. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand, and a thousand years are like one day. Family. In God's timetable, Jesus just died on the cross two days ago. A thousand years in our sight is as one day to the Lord. See, we, we, we think about time, we think about minutes and seconds, and we think about years, and we think about lifetimes and time spans of history. God is dwelling outside the realm of time and space. He's dwelling in eternity Family, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and he's coming quickly. He's coming quickly. It's going to happen soon and very, very soon. So and he also mentions this later on, but you've got to understand that uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's coming, and he's coming quickly. Verse 2 says, Who testified to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. I find this fascinating statement here. I find this fascinating. It had been 60 years since John had saw, seen Jesus. This is roughly 95 AD. Jesus died, rose from the grave or, or, you know, when he was 33 years old in the 30s. It had been 60 years since John had seen his Lord and Savior there at the ascension. But now... What had kept him going? What had, what had kept, what kept John going for all those years? What, what does it say? It says, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what kept him going, was his deep commitment to the word of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a word here. There's a word here for all leaders and all those who want to be influencers and, and be a witness. If you want to be effective in ministry, if you want to speak with authority, if you want to teach with authority, if you want to lead with authority, don't try to be cool and hip. Just teach the word and preach the gospel. That's all it takes. All we do as ministers in, in expository teaching is we just regurgitate what God says in his word. We expound on it and we open it up. You know, we look at verses and we study them. And, and, and we study them in context of the passage. And, and, and it's, like a, it's like a treasure. You know, I've been, this coming, uh, this coming Good Friday here in the spring of 2022 will be my, I'll be 30 years old as a Christian. Because it was in the spring of 1992 that I surrendered my life to Christ. And I've been reading the Bible now for 30 years. And I still feel like I'm just on the tip of the iceberg. Because each time I study it just gets richer and richer. You know, we got to be committed, as John was committed, as he says there in verse 2, committed to the word of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will be the thing that carries you in life. And that will be the determining factor on your effectiveness in ministry, is being committed to the scriptures and being committed to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads 
and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written for the time is, 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 is near. Verse 3 says we are blessed. Makarios is the Greek word. You know what that word means? It means we are happy. We are happy. We are fortunate that we have the word of God. It blesses our lives. We don't want to steer away from this book or move away from it. Because he said there's a special blessing. This is, this is why you embrace the book of Revelation. Because right here, verse 3, you are blessed. You are happy. It satisfies our soul. John says here, look, there's three things there in verse 3. Let's look at them for a second. There's three things that John says. Here, John says here is a, is a special blessing for those who do three things. Number one, you got to read the book of Revelation. Check. We're doing that. We are reading the book of Revelation. That's what we're doing right now. Secondly, we got to hear it. What are you doing right now? You are hearing the book of Revelation. Check. I'm reading the book of Revelation, and I'm hearing the book of Revelation. And then what does it say? It says, those who heed the book of Revelation. That box has not been checked yet. How do we heed the book of Revelation? How do you heed all this eschatology and the white horse and Jesus coming back as king of kings? How, how do you embrace the wrath of God being poured out in Revelation chapter 6 through 18? Here's how you heed it. You live with an eternal perspective. You, you live with an eternal perspective. Bring, break out your booklets one more time. Turn to the back page. What do we do? And I'm not going to read all this. You can go home and read it. But on the back page, what do we do until then? This is how you heed the book of Revelation. Number one, you walk submissively. What does that mean? What does it mean to walk submissively? It means you obey the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in your heart of hearts, you say, I am going to live my life for him, and I'm going to obey his word. Not because I'm trying to be religious or pharisaical or, or legalistic, but because I love Jesus, and he's so good to me. Second, we worship triumphantly. You know, we worship. Worship is a lifestyle, and we go out and we live our lives with a, with a triumph in our hearts. But worship is also singing songs, but we just come to here. We come into his presence, and we say, Lord Jesus, I worship you with all my heart. I worship you triumphantly. You're not this little meek and mild Jesus, but you're the sovereign Lord and creator of the universe. Thirdly, we witness urgently. We plead with people, please come to Christ. You need to be saved. You need to find out how to find forgiveness of sin. Share the gospel with as many people as often as you can. That's what it means to heed the book of Revelation. We work fervently. Man, there's, there's work to be done in the kingdom. From children's ministry to outreach to, uh, what's the name of the ministry that y'all are a part of? The, the Moment of Hope ministry. To, for unplanned pregnancies, to, to all the ministries that we're a part of. There's work to be done in the kingdom of God and discipling, and we need to work. And then finally, watch expectantly. One day, we're going to hear the horn. We're going we're to hear the, the uh, trumpet, excuse me. We're going to hear it, and he's going to come back as the king of kings. That's what it means to heed the book of Revelation. Why is it important? Look at the end of verse 3. He says, for, there, there, there's a connecting word there. Why do we read, hear, and heed? For the time is near. Christ will return. Amen? All right, let's look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, oh boy, here we go. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And I want to read four more words at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, uh-oh, we started our study on the Revelation, and we've already come to a difficult phrase. What is the seven spirits who are before the throne? What are the seven spirits? What's our two rules of interpretation? Context, and what else? Commentary. So let's look at it. Let's, let's, let's look at, we're, we're looking at verse 4, we're asking the question, who or what are the seven spirits who
who are before the throne of God. Context. Now, if you're looking at verse 4 in your verse 5, did anybody else see the Trinity? Look at it. Before the seven spirits who are before the throne, what does it say before that? It says, from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's not the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is mentioned at the beginning of verse 5. So, and he uses the word and. It, it, these are distinct. It's this person and this person and this person. So before the seven spirits of God, you have uh, from him who was and is to come. That is God the Father. That is God the Father. And then he uses the word and signifying a different person from the seven spirits who are before the throne. We're going to come back to that. In the beginning of verse 5, you see the word and again signifying a change. And from Jesus Christ, who's left? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. This is a reference. You know, there's a reference to the Father. There's a reference to uh, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ. But then we have to ask the question, why is he called the seven spirits? Are there seven Holy Spirits? And the answer is no. There's only one Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor David, what is he talking about here? Bring up Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Many commentators, and I agree with them, believe that this phrase in verse 4, the seven spirits who are before the throne, is a reference to the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. And over in Isaiah uh, chapter 11, verse 2, it reads this, it says this, the prophet Isaiah says, And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the Spirit of counsel and strength, and the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This reference in the book of Revelation is a reference to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, is something that he wants to do in each and every one of your lives. Family, friends, if you are a believer in Christ and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, God wants you to understand this verse and experience this verse. What does the first part of the verse say? The Spirit of the Lord will what? Rest upon him. You know, the Spirit of the Lord fills our hearts. He fills that inner man, your soul, that person you are on the inside, that the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells there. And you need to know that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And then the Holy Spirit will give you the spirit of wisdom. What is wisdom? I love this word. Wisdom is the art of skillful living. And when you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, and you're being led by the Spirit and listening to the Spirit, He will give you the art of skillful living. He'll help you make wise decisions. He will give you wisdom as you meditate on the Scriptures and you yield to the Spirit. You will have wisdom. Understanding. Boy, do we need that or what? We need understanding. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and say, Holy Spirit, please give me understanding. Give me, number one, understanding of the Word of God. You know, some of us are just hearing the Word and it's going in one ear and out the other, and there's no application, but we need the Word of God to understand it, to take it to heart, to let it penetrate deep. And then also the Holy Spirit gives us understanding for the world around us, gives us a spirit of wisdom and discernment a sign of the times, to understand what's going on, to not fall for deception, but to understand the world by having a, a biblical worldview, the spirit of counsel. You know, who do we go to when we need advice? Do you, do you go to your spouse? I hope so. Please go to your spouse. Do, do, do you go to your mom and dad? Great, keep on going. Go to your mom and dad. Do you go to your pastor? He's another great person to go talk to. But the greatest counselor? is the Holy Spirit. You know, when we're faced with a difficult situation, when you're faced with a trying situation in life, 
we need to take it to the Holy Spirit and let him be our counsel. He's our strength. Man, we need strength today. The world is just bombarding us with temptation and evilness and wickedness and sin. And if there was ever a day that we needed strength and power, it's today. Well, friends, I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit can give you that strength and that power to resist temptation. The next one, the spirit of knowledge. You know, we need to have knowledge. You know, when we study the Word of God, don't, don't, don't check your brain at the door. I want you to think long and hard about this. I want you to circle words. I want you to go back and, and study it. And break out Vine's expository dictionary and break out the word and, and look at commentaries and listen to teaching and, and examine everything that's said. But we need to absorb it into our minds. You know, at Calvary, some people say, many people at Calvary Chapel, y'all just about, all y'all care about is brainwashing people. And to that I say, amen. We are about brainwashing people. We're about brainwashing people with the word of God. Brainwashing people so they, they think biblically. And they see the world through as a Christian. Then finally, the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit operating in your life will produce a fear of the Lord. God is not our pie in the sky. He's not our buddy. He is holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. It doesn't mean you're scared of him. It doesn't mean that you're fearful or frightful. But the fear of the Lord means you respect God. You respect God and you stand in awe of his holiness and his glory and his power. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Hey, check this out. If you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, guess what we're starting Wednesday night? We're studying it. This coming Wednesday night, I'll be right here in the sanctuary, right here, and we're going to do an eight-week study, an in-depth study, and it's going to be on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who he is. I think this, this coming Wednesday, we're going, to start, we're going to lay the foundation. We're going to talk about the Trinity and then we're going to talk about his deity, his personality, and the most important things he does. But we're going to spend eight weeks studying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I hope you will join us this Wednesday night. But verse 11, let's, let's just reel it back into Revelation chapter 4. The seven spirits who are before his throne is a reference to the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. There in verse 4, John he introduces himself, then he introduces God the Father, then he introduces the Holy Spirit, and then let's roll into verse 5. Verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. This is another reason why we embrace the book of Revelation. This is another reason why we dive into it. Because you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ in all he is. The sovereign king and Lord of the universe. You get to understand who he is. I didn't count it. I, I meant to. Uh, it just slipped my mind. But I'll, I'll make a count this week. There's, I want to say there's between 40 and 50 different titles of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. There's lots of titles of who he is. But let's look at these in verse, um, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ... The faithful witness. You know, back in John chapter 18, there's a conversation that takes place between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. I don't think it bodes too well for Pilate in eternity. But uh, in John chapter 18, uh, Pilate said to him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You are correctly, you are correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And Jesus, the word of, is saying here in verse 5, when it says he's the faithful witness, he's saying that everything he says is true. There are a lot of political and religious voices out there today that are clamoring for your attention. But there is only one that you should listen to, and that is the faithful witness, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus says in his word is trustworthy and true. You can trust him. Jesus said in John 17, 17, 
Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. When you open up your Bible and you read it, it, it's not as if. It is the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you. And as you meditate on the word and you, and you feel yourself with the word, the Holy Spirit will begin to speak into your life and remind you of the things that you study. That is, family, the faithful witness, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, after he's the faithful witness, he's the firstborn of the dead. What's up with that phrase? Firstborn of the dead. You know, you have these two opposite spectrums. You have the firstborn, meaning so when someone's born and they come into this world, and then you have death when someone passes away. He's the firstborn of the dead. What's he talking about there? Here's what he's talking about. When the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the grave early on that Sunday morning, he received a resurrected, eternal, physical body. And he was the first. He wasn't the first person to be uh, raised from the dead because we know from the Gospels and we know from the Old Testament other people had been raised from the dead. But he was the first one to rise from the grave and to receive an eternal, immortal body that is not subject to death. He is the, the, uh, the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to put on a true, immortal body at his resurrection. And guess what? You got one waiting for you because of your faith and trust in Christ and believing in him. These are big thoughts, Okay. And this is sometimes hard to get our minds wrapped around, but it's the truth. One day you're going to wake up in glory. And there's going to be no more death, no more sickness, no more disease because you have a, 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 an immortal body in the same manner that the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the first. That's why he was able to ascend planet Earth and go through the universe to a place called the third heaven because his body was not subject to disease or nature, or law, or none of that. It was a supernatural body. He, could, he, he went through walls to his disciples, just poof, and he went there, and he just appeared. You know, when you receive this new body in the new heavens and the new earth, you can be like, hey, I want to go to Mars. Poof, you're going to go there, and you're going to be at Mars. It's going to be awesome, family. It's going to be mind-blowing. It's going to be outside the realm of our thinking, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. He was the firstborn of the dead, and we will receive. The second phrase there is, uh, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the true ruler of the universe and of the world. Revelation chapter 19 verse 16 says, on his robe and his thighs he has a name written, which says what? King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When you proclaim that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, you know what you're saying? You know what that is? That's a pledge of allegiance. That's a pledge of allegiance. That, Lord Jesus, you are the king. You are the ruler. You're the one that rules and reigns. You are the true president and ruler of all the world. Think about every politician you know. Think about them all. Every Democrat, every Republican, every Libertarian, they will, they will, before Christ determines their eternal destination in heaven or hell, they will bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he is the sovereign ruler. He is the king. He is the king of our hearts, the kings of our, king of our life. He's the king of the earth. He's the king of the universe, and he will be the king for throughout all eternity. There will be no more democracy when he returns. It will be a theocracy. He will rule and reign in his kingdom. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He says next, um, I love this. Verse 5, he says, To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. I love this because in this, John is reminding us of the gospel and he's reminding us of that age-old sentence. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible says, says it. So for him who loved us and released us by our sins, Jesus, John reminds us of Jesus' great love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We need to remember that. We need to remember that in the hard times. We need to remember that when we fall away. 
We need to remember that when life is not going the way we want it, that Christ loves us. And he loved us by dying on the cross for us. You know, when our, our kids come to us, a little, little Johnny, little Sarah comes to us and say, Mommy, Daddy, how much do you love me? What do us mom and dads do? We say, we love you this much. We love you this much, and we stretch out our arms. Jesus said the same thing, except he stretched out his arms on a cross. And he says to us prophetically, through his word, through this preacher, through the, through the word of God, that I love you this much. Okay? Don't doubt the love of God. Don't doubt the love of God. Okay? He sent his son into this world to prove his love. Okay? To prove his great love. So when you feel like you've blown it, and you feel like you can't go no more, or you feel like you've done something that you've just really blown it, and you're thinking to yourself, there's no way God could love me. Don't let that throat cross into your mind. God loves you. The Lord loves you loves you and he demonstrated it at the cross what an amazing amazing thing so he's the firstborn of the dead he's the ruler of the earth he's the faithful witness he's the one who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood you know uh, when Jesus cried on the cross my God my God why hast thou forsaken me Eli Eli Lama Sabbathani my God my God why hast thou forsaken me you know God the Father was pouring out his wrath on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he wouldn't have to pour the wrath out on us. Jesus, that's what we, that's what we mean when we say Jesus died on the cross. That's love. That's love. The same thing if something was to happen to my son or my daughter, man, I would give my life for them, you know, because I love them and they know that. Well, your heavenly Father loves you. Jesus loves you. And he went to the cross and he'll do whatever it takes to bring you to himself. Amen? Verse 6. Verse 6. It says, And he has made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It says he has made us. Who's us? That's me and you. He's made us to be a kingdom and priest. You know what that means? We're royalty. We, we, you and I are royalty. We, we were the slum of the earth. We were dirt bags. We were wretched sinners. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords invited us to come into his palace, into his heavenly throne room, and he makes us a priest. He, he makes us royalty. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter reminds us, and he reminds you and I today, that we are chosen. When did he choose you? He chose you before the foundation of the world. You are royal priesthood. He has given you his signet ring. He's crowned you with righteousness, and you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. What does that mean? The word holy means to be set apart to be sanctified. He has set you apart. He has made you holy. And, and it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the, uh, his own special people, you are special in God's eyes. God has a plan for each and every one of us in his kingdom that we may proclaim the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How, what a beautiful statement there that we are royalty, that, that, that we are his royalty. And it says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In other words, this kingdom will not end. This kingdom will be forever. 10,000 years from now, wherever you're at, hopefully you'll be in heaven shouting his praises. You will be there forever and ever. It is a kingdom without end. And, and all these little thoughts of harps and lyres and angels in the cloud floating around and you know whatever all that stuff get all that out your mind okay we're going to be in a new heavens and a new earth it's going to be like i believe it's going to be like the world today just like planet earth is today it's going to be like just like it is today it's gonna, there's going to be no sin there's going to be no sickness there's going to be a, a new jerusalem in the in, in the capital of the earth and we're going to enjoy this we're going to be kingdom and priest let's uh look at the next verse Verse 7, okay, here now, now when you get to verse 7, 
We talked about this in the introduction. We talked about Old Testament references. Well, in verse 7, we have our first Old Testament reference. He says in verse 7, Behold, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Stop right there. Look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Most of your Bibles probably has that in small caps. When you see in the New Testament a phrase written with small caps, that means it's a reference to the Old Testament. This would have gripped John's Jewish listeners who were reading this book. John's not talking about the white clouds that circle our planet. When he uses that word clouds there, what's he talking about? He's talking about the Shekinah glory, the literal presence of God, the, the presence of God that went with the children of Israel through the desert, the Shekinah glory that came down on the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory that was there in the Holy of Holies. He is coming with this cloud. He is coming with the glory. Uh, this uh, Old Testament reference comes from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, which I want to read to you. It says, Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. What we were just looking at in, in Revelation chapter 1. That all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. What is Daniel prophesying there in Daniel chapter 7? He is talking about this future kingdom that God is going to establish through the Son of Man, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So He's becoming. He, he, behold, He is coming with the clouds. And let's 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 break down verse seven. What does it say next? After it says He's coming with the clouds, look at it. It says, "And every eye will see Him." Now wait a minute. How is every eye going to see Him? If if he descends over the nation of Israel. How are the people in Japan or California who are on the opposite side of the planet, how, are all, how, how is every eye going to see him on that day? Well, I think it goes back to the beginning of the verse where it says, he is coming with the clouds. And if you understand that phrase clouds as a reference to the Shekinah glory, to the glory of God, this bright, unapproachable light, that when he splits that heaven, when he splits the heavens and he returns again as king of kings and lord of lords, his glory is going to be so majestic. It's going to light up the universe. Okay? So this, this ain't going to be like some little secret return and, and nobody sees. This is going to be a glorious light as the heavens are rend and he comes down as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every eye is going to see it. Every person is going to know. And then it says there, the next part of the verse, we can, I could preach on each one of these. It says, after it says, every eye will see him, then what does it say? Even those who pierced him. Two interpretations to this part of the scripture. And we'll talk about that a lot as we go through the book of Revelation when there's multiple views. But the, and, and, and I'm good with both of them. I'm good with both of these. Uh, even those who pierced him. The first interpretation, those who pierced him, he's talking about the nation of Israel. In other words, the Jewish nation will be back in existence um, at his rapture, at the return, during the Great Tribulation. And even those who pierced him. So this is talking about the national state uh, of Israel, the nation, that they will know and they will see and they will witness this event. It could be that, or it could be, he told, even those who pierced him, he could be talking about the soldiers. He could, he could be talking about the Roman soldiers that crucified him on that day, that jabbed the spear in the side, that put him to the cross. How in the world, man, are they going to see him? Because they're dust by now. They're dust in the sands of Israel. How, how are they going to see him? you got to understand the resurrection, at the resurrection, every single person is going to be raised to life. And God knows where every single particle of every single person that's ever lived, he knows exactly where that particle is. And at the resurrection, every single person is going to be raised to life from the beginning of time to the end of time. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And even those soldiers that pierced him, hopefully 
they put their trust in Christ and hopefully they, they joined the church. And, uh, but every, every eye will see him. Every, the nation of Israel, the soldiers, even those who pierced him, a reference to the nation of Israel and to those who crucified him. And then it says, let's look at the next part of the verse. There's, a, there's so much you can learn when, we, when, you, when you meditate and you look at these, these verses. They're, they're powerful. Because I think in the next part of the verse, it applies, to the, it applies to the whole world of those who don't receive Christ. Look at it. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. You know, Christ came to bring great joy. He came to bring a great salvation, an amazing salvation. But for those who fail to trust in him, there will come a day of unspeakable horror and terror. How many of you guys remember DC Talk back in the 90s? Watched the movie, watched the Jesus movie the other night with them guys in it. DC Talk wrote a song that still resonates in my heart. They wrote it back in the 90s, or at least I don't know if they wrote it, they, they at least sang it. But uh, I'm going to give you a, a line from their song from DC Talk. It says, a man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we had all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. The father spoke and the demons died. How could we have been so blind? There's no time to change your mind. The son has come and you have been left behind. You know, it's tragic and it's sad and, and it breaks my heart to think that people could live this life without Christ. I mean, it just tears me up. You know, I just want to share the gospel with people. I want to share the love of Jesus with them. I want them to, to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and become a Christian. But when they reject and they turn away and they say, no thanks, it rips me to pieces. It rips me to pieces. Because it's not like you reject Christ and then, okay, that's not my religion. I'm going to go on about my life. There's coming a day where they will remember that moment when the Son of God comes in all his glory. And I, I believe that when Jesus Christ comes again, that every person that's had an opportunity to receive him and follow him as their Lord and Savior, and, and they rejected it, they will remember that in that very moment, and they will fall to their knees in horror, thinking, what in the H-E-double-L have I done? What have I done? I made the greatest mistake. His salvation is free. It's a gift, okay? There's nothing you can do to be saved. It was accomplished at the cross. And all you have to do is trust in it and live for him. It's an amazing thing. You know, I've been a pastor now for eight years. I can't believe I've been a pastor for eight years. I had to count as I was thinking about this. And um, I've been called to the bedside of many people preparing to step into eternity. And I've had a lot of people say, hey, I want to make sure. I want to make sure. And I'm like, God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. And we'll pray together. We'll share scripture together. And they'll make peace with God. They'll, they'll understand the cross. They'll, yes, I'm trusting in him. I'm loving him. I'm ready to see him. And I, I, I praise the Lord and I rejoice in those situations where they've turned to Christ. But I have been bedside with someone who's preparing to pass away, and they have told me, no thanks. I'm good. Don't need it. I'm good. I, uh, not, not I'm good in the sense that I have Christ, but I don't, I don't need your gospel. I don't need your Jesus. In, in my heart of compassion and love and, and just humbleness and like, oh, gosh, you know, I want to tell them, sir, ma'am, you're fixing to be more alive when you pass than you are now. Please put your trust in Christ. You know, to step into eternity without Christ is, is the most horrifying thought 
You know, we plead with people. We beg with people. I think it was Charles Spurgeon. One of the greats said it. I can't remember which one. He said, if they go to hell, let them go to hell with their arms wrapped around their ankles. Saying, please, please put your trust in Christ. You know, we're not trying to spread religion. We're trying to spread God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's peace. Man, imagine what it's going to be like, man. That it's, it's, it's going to be difficult, you know, when you face your passing. And, and I don't welcome it. I don't look forward to it. And sometimes there can be some morbid, morbid, morbid thoughts about it. But to think about the glory that you're going to experience on the other side gives us hope. It gives us hope. But as Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says it right there in the word. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. For those who are not prepared, those who reject his kind offer, it, it will be a very rough day mentally. They think they're stressed out now. They ain't seen nothing yet. Let's wrap it up here. Verse 8. Verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Our final verse this morning I opened up my message with how do we embrace the book of Revelation? That was my theme. How do, I, how do I stir your emotions? How do I stir your hearts? How do I get you plugged into this and get you home and reading and studying and looking at your chart and reading your Bible? Here's how we embrace the book of Revelation. Here it is. I get you a, I get you a bookmark too. How about that? That's, and that's our final verse that we're looking at this morning. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end says the Lord God Almighty. I got it. I can't read that small print. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. How do we embrace the book of Revelation? By embracing the key figure in the book of Revelation. By embracing the Lord God Almighty. By embracing the Alpha and the Omega. By the way, the Alpha and the Omega... That, that is just the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, meaning he's the beginning and the end. That would be like us to, today saying he's the, the, the alpha and the Zulu. He's the, he's the beginning and the end. By embracing the Lord Jesus Christ, the book <clears throat> of Revelation is the consummation of the age. There's still a work to be done, and that is heaven and that is the removal of of, of who, who likes death anybody i don't like death can't stand it can't stand the thought of it but the book of revelation is god removing death from the equation praise the lord the book of revelation is the lord jesus christ the sovereign lord removing sin from the equation no more colds no more sickness no more covid no more death, no more none of that stuff. Praise the Lord, amen? That's what this book is. And we're going to see some exciting stuff. And we're going to see all, all these symbols and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're going to talk about the literal thousand-year reign. But don't get too caught up in, in, in the, uh, understand them, but as we study each chapter of the book of Revelation, look at the central theme of the book of Revelation, which he talks about here in verse 8. Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Amen? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, thank you for this awesome study in the book of Revelation. Lord, I hope that everyone here is as excited as I am and Father, if they're not, Lord, give them a zeal. Let this, this these, looking at these eight verses this morning, let it whet their appetite and help them to desire to come back and study this amazing book with us. Lord Jesus, you are truly the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the firstborn of the dead, the faithful witness. You are the sovereign Lord of the universe, and we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, the name above all names, the Alpha and the Omega, we pray. Amen.
Amen.